Welcome everyone to our Ignite Startup Workshop. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Amanda Golden and I am the Program Manager in the Herb Kelleher Entrepreneurship Center. And the Herb Kelleher Entrepreneurship Center promotes the development of entrepreneurial skills and supports the exploration of the ways those skills can be applied in a variety of career fields, either as founders or as innovators in established firms. Our Ignite Startup Workshops provide an opportunity for students to learn more about different topics related to new venture creation. These workshops host leaders from various industries and on-campus experts to enable students, faculty, staff, and the greater Austin entrepreneurial community to gain usable skills and insights for launching an idea into a startup or pursuing other career opportunities. Today, we are excited to welcome Raj Raghunathan uh, to discuss design thinking. Raj is a professor of marketing at the Macomb School of Business in the University of Texas at Austin, where he relies on themes from psychology, behavioral sciences, decision theory, and marketing to explain consumption behavior. He also studies the impact that people's judgments and decisions have on their own happiness and fulfillment. Based on his research, he teaches a very successful online course on Coursera on happiness named A Life of Happiness and Fulfillment, and also published a book titled If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Happy, uh, which was released in the US, the UK, and India in 2016. Raj, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Amanda. I'm very pleased to be here as well. All right, well, I will turn it over to you and we can get started. All right, thank you, Kara, for compliments on my book title. I think it's a cool title too, a little bit provocative, of course, but um, very much uh, signaling that it is aimed at people who are smart and successful, but not necessarily happy. So the kind of people in the business world that we interact with on, a, on an everyday basis. Okay, so but today's topic is going to be very different from happiness, although you'll see a connection to it toward the end. I'm going to be giving you guys a little bit of a primer for this topic of design thinking. And um, I'll start out by saying that design thinking has become a bit of a buzzword um, in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years. Uh, before that, I used to actually teach a course called Customer Insights, which uh, involved a lot of design thinking, except that that term wasn't very popular then. And it became popular, I'd say, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s in a kind of a lay person popular way. Uh, before that, it was used in certain circles. Uh, and then uh, once it achieved the status of a buzzword, I guess, or a buzz term, um, these, uh, the Macomb School of Business decided to offer a course on design thinking, which is what I teach now to the undergraduate students. It's called Design Thinking for Business Innovation. Okay, so what exactly is design thinking? Let me start with the definition. And you know, you ask 10 different people about design thinking and they're all involved in design thinking, they might come up with slightly different definitions, but I don't think that anybody is really going to disagree with this definition of design thinking. Um, so, and this is the definition that I've adopted from some other researchers and uh, teachers, uh, instructors who are, are interested in the topic. And um, they define design thinking as an iterative way of solving human-centered mysteries. Okay, so I've underlined a few of those um, uh, terms there because they, those are key terms, okay? And they're gonna be captured um, in the following tenets, the three tenets that I talk about a little bit here, okay? So at least two of them is gonna be captured. Um, so iterative means that you don't, um, uh, you, you, you acknowledge that you don't come up with a solution in a flash. So that's the second tenet that you see as a bullet point. Um, under the definition, right? The ideal product doesn't come about in a flash, but rather it comes about in incremental steps and you've already reconciled yourself to it. So what this means is that um, we'll later see a little video uh, in which one of the um, characters in the video says that uh, you fail often in order to succeed sooner. So you're ready to fail often in order to succeed sooner. So you're gonna try out a few things that you think might work out, but you know that it's probably not going to work out in the first try. And so you're ready to try out a few more options or a few more variants of a product or a service until uh, you get to the, um, the ideal product, okay, or the best product that you can come up with. 
So that's the iterative part of it. The human-centered part of it has to do with the uh, third tenet. Um, so the idea is that you are trying to solve problems for human beings. And I'm going to argue that in general, human beings are really interested in one and only one thing, ultimately. And that is to lead a happy and fulfilling life. And so as a marketer or as a designer of products or a inventor of products, entrepreneur, et cetera, you need to keep that in mind. So when they encounter your product, they're going to be not so concerned about exactly how your product works, but rather how it makes them feel. And so you have to take into account the context or the circumstances under which they are going to be interacting with your product. Okay, so that's going to be an important thing. And of course, you can do a lot of things in order to facilitate the possibility or increase the chances that they end up having positive emotions. So the mystery is part of it. Okay, let me get to that. And then I'll walk you through some of these tenets so that we have a well-rounded understanding of what design thinking means. So mysteries uh, is basically a term that design thinkers use to refer to a certain kind of a problem that we're trying to solve. So you can contrast mysteries, contrast uh, mysteries with puzzles. And puzzles are problems that have a right answer, quote unquote. Okay, so you can logically, um, rationally, using certain formulas or, or critical thinking, arrive at the solution. Okay, usually it's only one solution to a puzzle. So for example, um, given the current sizes of motherboards and uh, various things that go into a laptop, uh, what is the minimum size that a laptop can be? That's a puzzle, okay? So it's an optimization problem. You need to figure out what the minimum cubic feet of a laptop can be given all the components that need to go into it. That's a puzzle. Okay, by contrast, uh, if you were to ask a different problem, for example, that um, I want to um, minimize the boredom that people feel when they travel on uh, airplanes. I mean, maybe that's a bad example during COVID because you know it's been a while since many of us have, uh, have flown. It's certainly been over a year for me since I took my last flight, but um, you know, I'm sure that all of us remember flying and those of us who have taken international flights, it's, it's kind of boring, right? Um, it often can be boring at least. And, and so the, that's a mystery, okay? Uh, so how do you minimize the boredom, um, negative emotions, et cetera, the kind of you know, anxiety or the um, uh, hyper uh, kind of feeling that people have uh, in wanting to reach their destination in quick time? How can you solve that? How can you mitigate it? That would be a mystery, okay? So you might think of various ways in which you could solve it, but it's not a, uh, it's not a problem for which there is a uh, one right answer that can be logically, uh, rationally derived, okay? So it's um, uh, design thinking has to do with uh, solving human-centered mysteries rather than puzzles, okay? So this is one definition of design thinking. I particularly like it. It's a little bit lengthy, I suppose, but it captures, I think, most of what we mean by design thinking. And in particular, those three core tenets are the most important ones to remember. So let me start with the very first one. People often can't tell you what they really want or what they really need. And this is very important because as entrepreneurs, uh, as marketers, et cetera, we are trying to design products and services or apps that uh, cater to customers' needs, right? Uh, if you are able to cater to a prevalent and intense customer need, chances are that they're going to be willing to pay money for it. And so you might think, okay, the best approach to getting at a customer's uh, need is to ask them, what do you need, right? Uh, but it turns out that they might, they might actually not really know <laughs> what they need or want. So asking them directly is gonna get you theories about what they think they need but not necessarily what exactly they need. So let me give you a couple of examples of this, right? I mean, not necessarily in a product context, but it still gets at the same uh, kind of underlying point that they don't often know what they truly need or want. So this is from um, a anthropologist's work back in the 1950s and 60s, a guy called White. Um, he was um, commissioned by the city of New York to improve uh, people's, the citizens of New York's experience in Central Park, right? So um, he went around asking a lot of um, people who lived in New York, uh, what exactly do you want in a park? What would you like to see in a park? And he got answers that suggested that what people would truly love to see in a park is a lot of tranquility, you know, ponds and lakes and 
um, you know, huge trees, ducks floating around in the pond, you know, scenes of nature, especially in New York City, right, where that kind of a thing is not uh, so easy to come by because it's a concrete jungle. So um, something that reminded people about nature and things like that, that's what uh, he discovered people uh, said they wanted to see in the park. But when he went around looking at various parts of the park that were most popular, it turned out that the parts of the park that were most popular were the parts in which there were a lot of people, okay? And nobody had come up with that, that, you know, I'd like to go uh, to a part of a park or I'd like to see a lot of people in the park, right? I'd like to see a lot of hubbub, a lot of activity, a um, lot of opportunities for people watching, see and be seen kind of a thing, okay? Um, uh, so that's truly what we desire oftentimes, even in a park, it turns out that uh, we um, go where everybody else is, right? So this reminds me of a Yogi Berra kind of a saying, he always used to come up with these catchy um, kind of, um, uh, you know, very uh, memorable um, pithy quotes. And one of his quotes is that, um, oh, people never don't go there anymore because it's too crowded, right? So it captures this idea that we don't think that we're gonna like um, places that are gonna be crowded and maybe that's going to be a little bit truer now with COVID. Now that we've spent a lot of time at home, it's going to take a little bit of time to ramp back up to where we were before. But um, we think that we don't like to go to places that are crowded, but in reality, uh, we do go to those places. And that is captured by that quote by Yogi Berra as well, that people don't go there anymore. That captures the idea that people think they don't want to go to places that are crowded, right? Because it's too crowded, captures that, hey, if it's too crowded, then people are already there, right? Um, so what do you mean people don't want to go there? Okay, so that's an example. Another example could be um, if you ask people uh, what is gonna make you happy to live in a, a smallish kind of downtown apartment, um, which is uh, not got enough space for everything that you have, you're gonna downsize a little bit, right? Uh, and maybe even um, share some spaces with your spouse or other people. Let's say a, a thousand square foot uh, apartment in downtown, or would you like a 2,500 square foot house in the suburbs. And most people, uh, you know, if you just look at what's called revealed preference in uh, economics, right, where do people choose to live? It turns out that most people choose to live in the suburbs, uh, in the suburbs, right? Um, and so it seems that people have already answered their question with their money, in a sense. And what, what they think will make them happier is a bigger home, uh, farther away from work, place of work, and place of socializing, and place of shopping, etc. And if you look at the um, research on this topic though, what, what it finds is that the smaller the triangle, right? I mean, I just used some other numbers here, but um, you know, it's the same, same concept. So it turns out, what, what do you think would make you happier? People think that it's the suburban home, which is bigger. But in reality, the smaller this triangle, the larger your happiness. So even though um, you're gonna be living in a smaller apartment, uh, if uh, you live in an uh, area where uh, you're very close to where you work and very close to where you shop and socialize, uh, you're going to be happier. Uh, and people don't seem to have the intuition that they're going to adjust and adapt really quickly to the size of the home. Uh, if it gets smaller, they're going to, you know, maybe for a month or two, they're going to, um, you know, um, be uncomfortable or not know where things go, but they're going to adjust pretty quickly. Okay. Lots of evidence for this idea that people don't really know uh, what they truly want or need. They often don't know why it is that they bought a product. Okay, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that example later as well. Okay, so um, that's the first tenet, um, and the second tenet has to do with this uh, iterative process that I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, the idea is also reflected in this tenet, which is that the ideal product, or the perfect product, or the product that you launch eventually doesn't come about in a flash, but rather in incremental steps. Okay, I mean, it's a you know, famous example of this is of course the light bulb, right? Edison famously tested some thousand different variants of it before uh, he ended up with one that actually worked uh, reliably well, right? Um, so, and that's true for uh, almost any product that comes out. You know, if you've ever worked in a product space, you know this to be true, right? It, it takes a long, long time. And we think about the ideation of a product, right? And the creation of a product as being the main thing. But in reality, um, you know, from that ideation point, which is the question mark, 
to actually kind of launching it in the in the marketplace and making profits uh, out of it in particular there is a long and arduous and not at all a linear path we think of it in terms of steps that follow one each other right uh, quite logically and linearly it turns out that that's not how it uh, how it works at all okay and this is how tim brennan uh, drew um, the uh, picture of how uh, you know they they end up launching a product Okay, and, and I might as well point out here that, and, and many of you might have an actual real world experience with this, um, that you know, the, uh, the process of coming up with a prototype for a product and uh, you know, finalizing the product details, it might seem like that's the big part and then the marketing and the launching is just, you know, it's just gonna follow naturally, it's gonna be easy to do. But in reality, the uh, coming up with the product prototype and you know, the details of it is actually uh, only about 10, 15% of what's left, right? Uh, it often takes um, months, uh, if not years, to actually launch the product. Okay, so um, this is not a linear path at all. And, and this is called the Moses myth, right? You just kind of part the sea and then walk uh, uh, on the riverbed and reach the other side, okay? It's, it's a much more non-linear path from ideation to actual product launch and of course, making profits. Okay, so uh, if you look at the genesis of the iPad, uh, for example, in the early 90s, uh, when John Scully was still with um, Apple, right? Uh, they, they, they launched Newton. Um, and uh, then uh, it turned out that it did not work. And a big reason why it did not work is because uh, people said that, hey, uh, the Newton was uh, bigger than the palm and it wouldn't fit into people's pockets, right? And so that's why uh, you know, it's not gonna work. So you need something that's much smaller. And uh, it turned out that one of the one of the competitors, uh, Palm Pilot, uh, from the company Palm, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, launched uh, the Palm Pilot in the uh, 1990s. And I actually owned a Palm Pilot for a little bit of time. Um, and then it turned out that uh, iPad did come out much later. Uh, its predecessor in Apple being Newton, right? After a gap of about 10, 15 years, um, they came out with the um, with the iPad. And it turned out that by that time, people had accepted something that was going to be bigger. Okay, so uh, it takes um, a kind of lot of iterations before uh, you can launch a successful product. Okay, and this idea is captured uh, really well in this uh, rather old video that some of you might have seen, um, but even if you've seen it, I'm sure that you'll find, find it interesting and uh, you wouldn't mind seeing it again. So I'm gonna play it now, it's, it's about eight minutes long, and then I'll pick it up uh, after it's over. Okay, so I actually, uh, open it up on in another tab and forwarded past the ads. So we should be ready to see it right away. Here we go. Tonight, the deep dive. One company's secret weapon for innovation. We went to IDEO, the product design folk, and said, take something old and familiar, like, say, the shopping cart, and completely redesign it for us in just five days. ABC News correspondent Jack Smith tells us what happened next. Nine in the morning, day one, and these people have a deadline to meet. So welcome to the kickoff of the shopping cart project. This is Palo Alto, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley. And these are designers at IDEO, probably the most influential product development firm in the world. IDEO has designed everything from high-tech medical equipment to the 25-foot mechanical whale in the movie Free Willy and the first computer mouse for Apple. Smith ski goggles, Nike sunglasses, NEC computer screens, hundreds of products we take for granted. The point is that we're not actually experts at any given area. You know, we're kind of experts on the process of how you design stuff. So we don't care if you give us a toothbrush, a toothpaste tube, a tractor, a space shuttle, you know, a chair. It's all the same to us. We, like, want to figure out how to innovate in, in, by using our process, applying it. Project leader is Peter Skillman, a 35-year-old Stanford engineer. Project leader because he's good with groups, not because of seniority. He's only been at IDEO for six years. The rest of the team is eclectic, but that's typical here. Whitney Mortimer, Harvard MBA. Peter Coughlin, linguist. 
Tom Kelly, Dave's brother, marketing expert. Jane Fulton Suri, psychologist. Alex Kazaks, 26, a biology major, who's turned down medical school three times because he's having too much fun at IDEO. Safety emerges early as an important issue. 22,000 child injuries a year, which is, and so they're hospitalized injuries. I mean, there, there are many others. And theft. It turns out a lot of carts are stolen. As the team works, it becomes clear there are no titles here, no permanent assignments. The other side says, gives a lot of help, says, be safe. <laughs> I'll give you a big red ball on a on a on a on a post, and that says you're a big guy. If you got a ball, you're a senior vice president. You know what do I care? The desk, the red ball, it's all the same. <laughs> in a very innovative culture, you can't have a kind of hierarchy of here's the boss and the next person down, the next person down, and the next person down, because it's impossible that the boss is the one who's had the insightful experience with shopping carts. It's just not possible. The team splits into groups to find out firsthand what. The the people who use, make, and repair shopping carts really think. Okay, go. The problem with the plastic cart is the wind catches it. Yeah. And these things have been clocked at 35 across the parking lot. <laughs> oh, cool. Man, that's actually a pretty good point. The, the trick is to find these real experts and so that you can learn much more quickly than you could by just kind of doing it the normal way and, and trying to learn about it yourself. From everything I read, these things aren't that safe either, you know? Um, so probably the seat itself is going to have to be redesigned. One of the interesting things for me is looking at how people really don't like to let go of the cart, except for the professional shopper, whose strategy is to leave the cart at various places. 3.30 in the afternoon, and the group is back at IDEO. There is no let-up. Each team is going to demonstrate and communicate and share everything that they've learned today. A uh, shopping cart has been clocked at 35 miles an hour traveling through a parking lot in the wind. We were in the store, what, two hours? And and it was truly frightening just to see the kind of stuff going on. You got to designate some people to make damn sure that the store owner's point of view is represented. After nine straight hours, the team is tired. They call it a day. So, uh, Everybody cool? Well, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot. We had a great time today. Yeah. Yeah. IDEO's mantra for innovation is written everywhere. One conversation at a time. Stay focused. Encourage wild ideas. Defer judgment. Build on the ideas of others. Uh, that's the hardest thing for people to do is to uh, restrain themselves from uh, uh, criticizing an idea. So if anybody starts to nail an idea, they get the bell. <laughs> ideas pour out and are posted on the walls. Oh, the blind, the, the privacy blind. Like when you're buying six cases of condoms, you know, no one sees. If it doesn't nest, we don't have a solution. For you. Organized chaos. I, it's not organized. Um, what it is is it's focused chaos. Vote with your post-it, not not with an idea that's cool, but with an idea that's cool and buildable. Um, if it's if it's too far out there and can't be built in a day, then I don't think we should vote on. Enlightened trial and error yeah. succeeds over the planning of lone genius. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genius. If anything sums up IDEO's approach, that is it. Worried that the team is drifting, what can only be called a group of self-appointed adults under Dave Kelly holds an informal side session. Four or five teams. Four or five teams. We, and we give each team a need area. It becomes very autocratic for a very short period of time in defining what things people are going to work on. If you don't work under time constraints, you, you could never get anything done because it's a messy process and go on forever. Back at the shop, it is six o'clock. The four mock-ups are ready for showings. Baskets also can be, if you think you will have more volume, baskets can be put in. A modular shopping cart you pile hen baskets onto. A high-tech cart that gets you through the traffic jam at checkout. That you could mount a scanner on the shopping cart so that you as the customer, as you pull it off the shelf, can scan each item. One that's built around child safety, and another that lets shoppers talk to the supermarket staff remotely. Uh, yeah, where can I find a yogurt? But the adults, again, decide more work needs to be done before the mock-ups can be combined into one last prototype. Can we have all the cards come up here for a second? I think you take a piece of each one of these ideas and kind of back it off a little bit and then put it in the, yeah, in the right. design. The design is still not there. 
But there's another motto at IDO, fail often in order to succeed sooner. And some of the team will be up half the night trying to put together a design that finally does work. There it is! We took the best elements out of each prototype. The cart, which is designed to cost about the same as today's carts, is different in every other way. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm very proud of the team. I think it's it's great. This, does this work for you? Works for me great. It's also beautiful. The cart's wheels turn 90 degrees so it can move sideways. No more lifting up the rear in a tight spot. And you shop in a totally different way. The bags are hung on hooks on the cart's frame. Remember, there is no basket here. At first, I was a little shocked, but I think it's you have some fantastic ideas here. It needs a little refining, but I think that it's great. I mean, we would we would want them. She also gave us some really good comments on how we can make this thing better. A lot of hours. Also, an open mind, a boss who demands fresh ideas be quirky and clash with his, a belief that chaos can be constructive and teamwork. A great deal of teamwork, and these the recipe for how innovation takes place. This is Jack Smith for Nightline, Palo Alto, California. All right, so I'm going to stop that. Oops. Do you want to pass the... And I'm going to reshare my screen and my PowerPoint slides. Okay, so um, a few things to um, talk about from that video, right? I mean, it is, like I said, quite dated. It came out in 1999, uh, which is uh, the year before I joined the Macomb School of Business. So I was teaching customer insights and it was very new then and mind blowing. And we all thought that, oh, you know, very soon we're gonna have these carts in our HEVs and stuff and it never happened. And it's partly because um, people are, people have a lot of inertia. Right, uh, it's difficult to change people, and you needed a chain of people to change for them to be able to a, produce these cards, and for a bunch of people to pre-order them and buy them, and so on. And the cards did get tested uh, in some centers, and it turned out that customers had inertia as well a little bit um, in um, adopting a new way of shopping, where they abandon the cart and then you know just go around shopping with their baskets, and then they come back and put the baskets on the cart. They were uncomfortable doing that. And uh, you know it's understandable why in retrospect, right? I mean, if you're in a grocery store and you leave that frame behind and go about uh, the store with the basket and you come back and the frame has vanished or something like that, you know, there's always a little bit of fear. It's not a big deal. You can go out and get another frame, I suppose, but it's too many moving parts, okay? So uh, that person at the end in Whole Foods uh, was right. You know, when she said that, you know, it needs to be refined a little bit, but there are some great ideas in there. And I'm sure that some of these ideas are actually gonna see the light of day in a couple of years. Um, and some of them have already come about, right? Um, so for example, the scanner, we have the kind of um, self-checkout lanes, uh, which kind of mimics it. It's, uh, the scanner is not on the cart itself, but um, it's in, in the, in the self-checkout lane. Um, anyway, the, the product um, that they came out with was really beautiful, very different from what existed then and what still exists today. And uh, you got to appreciate the process that they went through. And the critical element that I wanted to point out to you guys, as far as this uh, little um, presentation is concerned, is this idea that I touched upon, which is that uh, there's an iterative process um, uh, that you have to go through and it's very difficult to avoid it uh, in order to come up with a good solution to a problem, okay? It's a messy process. And so you need to have that focused chaos, right? That goes with it. Uh, it needs to be focused. Um, you know, the chaos part can't be avoided, but at least you can be focused. And uh, there are a couple of uh, statements that uh, got made during that, that uh, video that uh, I'd like to, I made a note of them, one of which I actually uh, articulated uh, earlier, which is that um, fail often uh, in order to succeed sooner. So you know that you're gonna encounter failures. You're gonna come up with ideas that in retrospect turn out to be too silly or too far-fetched or too expensive or something like that, but you do need those wild ideas um, in order to be able to come up with better ideas than you would have come up with had you not had those wild ideas, right? So that's the idea. And there's another statement that I really love. Uh, it, you know, one of the guys, uh, the, the leader guy, right? The Peter Skillman, even though he's only been at IDEO for six years, uh, he says it. He says that enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genius. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genius, which reminds me of, um, Thomas uh, Edison's quote, right? 
that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So if you look at almost any field, it turns out, I mean, I'm just gonna broaden it out of design thinking now to talk about achieving mastery, progressing towards skills, et cetera, in any field. If you look at any master in any field, it turns out now, there's just a lot of research on this. It's not that they were particularly gifted or you know they just had a lot of uh, things fall into their lap. Uh, the one thing that's common to any master in any field, be it business or music or sports or um, uh, software programming, whatever it is, it turns out that they put in these you know, 10,000 hours, right? I mean, which I'm sure that um, most of you have heard of uh, from Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. And it comes from research by a guy called Anders Ericsson, who unfortunately recently passed away in a book that I highly recommend called Peak, particularly those of you who have kids. Uh, if you want them to realize uh, what it takes to achieve mastery in any domain, it's just a lot of lot of elbow grease, right? 10,000 hours, which is not a joke, which is about 10, 15 years of your life in order to master any domain. So that's what it takes. And uh, I think that's reflected in this idea that to come up with a neat product, you need to spend a lot of time. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be like a chore. It doesn't need to be bad time, you know, aversive time, negative time, boring time. It can be fun. These guys are having a lot of fun. They're innovating and creating uh, while they're coming up with this product. But you do need to spend the time because the ideal product doesn't come about in a flash. Okay, so with that, and by the way, I'm gonna um, finish up in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. So we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. And if you do have questions, I noticed that Amanda had, um, had uh, mentioned in the chat that you can post your questions in the chat. And I imagine that she will be moderating the Q&A part of this. So let me just talk a little bit about the third tenet, which um, is, um, actually something that I could talk about for a very, very long time. You know, I teach a whole semester long course on this idea that uh, uh, people want to lead happy and fulfilling lives. And I really touch on this topic of what does it take to lead a fulfilling and happy life? Okay, that's the main topic. But here I want to uh, talk a little bit about the implications that this has for the design of products and design of experiences, design of services. Okay, so people really care about leading a happy and fulfilling life. And so that's true even in the context of using a particular product, okay? If the product that um, fails in some way, doesn't deliver, doesn't satisfy a need, uh, you can call that um, resulting emotion dissatisfaction or unhappiness, right? I mean, that is an emotion, that is a, uh, a feeling, right? And, and people don't like that. People would rather be in a, in a position where they actually experience positivity out of your product. Um, so this has had implications for um, how the economies have evolved over time. Uh, okay, so uh, if you think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, the idea is that you go from physiological needs of satisfaction of hunger and, and a lower order kind of needs, basic needs to satisfaction of uh, higher order needs like safety to love and then to self-esteem and then to um, self-actualization eventually, right? Through kind of knowledge and aesthetics and so on. So, um, uh, you know, there is some controversy around whether that's uh, the Maslow's hierarchy is necessarily completely true all the time for everyone, but by and large, it is a good representation of uh, the set of things that we need and the order in which we need them, right? We don't usually think about luxuries until our basic needs are satisfied, for example, right? So um, if you think about uh, the birthday cake as a specific example of a product, and if you think about how it might have evolved over time uh, to satisfy higher and higher order needs, um, then you know you you come up with uh, what might we call an evolution of the economy. So 100 years back, for example, uh, people used to make the birthday cake from scratch, uh, which is um, buying commodities like flour and eggs and sugar, and maybe they're not even branded, so you don't know the quality. Maybe there's a little bit of uh, pebbles in the in the in the flour that got ground up with the, uh, with the flour uh, because you got it uh, in a commodity store, right? That's 100 years back, but it cost only a few dimes. And then you um, uh, rewind back now, maybe 60, 70 years actually, rather than 50 years, uh, Betty Crocker comes out with this pre-mixed uh, birthday cake, right? So it's now branded. And so you're assured of the quality. And every time you bake it, uh, you have a certain confidence that it's going to come out the same way, et cetera. Right? So that's about 50, 60 years back. But for that um, assurance, for that you know, safety, if you will, of buying a branded product, uh, you pay uh, maybe 10, 20 times more. And then 
uh, about 40 years now back, um, you had the bakery saying, you know what, hey, don't worry about it. You know, we'll take the hard work out of your hands, right? Even with the pre-mix, you have to kind of buy eggs and uh, bake it and so on. So we'll take all that out of your hand and actually deliver this cake for you, right? And it's gonna look beautiful. It's gonna be customized even, right? Uh, with things that you may find it really difficult to do. Um, and that's gonna then, you know, cost you another 10 to 20 times more, you know, uh, maybe $20. And now in the last 20 years, that is, uh, we have the birthday cake still be part of the birthday celebration. You know, that's a central event when everybody gathers around the cake and you know, there's candles lit and so on. And, and you know, they sing the song, right? And nobody really leaves until that, that happens. That's still the central event, but um, the cake is used as a prop, right? To stage an experience. And so you might have uh, jugglers, you might have magicians, you might have games, you might have party favors and all of these things are happening around that cake, okay? And for that event to be um, organized though, it's gonna cost you another 10 times that perhaps, right? Or maybe even more nowadays, maybe even $500 is not too high an amount for people to spend on their kids' birthdays, okay? And why is this evolution happening? At one level, it's happening because the kinds of things that people need in order to be happy differ uh, depending on where they are in the uh, Maslow's hierarchy. So if a country is poor, by and large, most people are still struggling with commodities and physiological needs of food, clothing, shelter, et cetera. And so that is what is gonna satisfy them and make them feel happy. But if they move past it, uh, as you might have in a kind of developing country, then people are looking for security and safety and reliability of brands, and they're willing to pay a little bit more. And then if you go into a service economy, which a lot of the kind of you know countries like Mexico and Costa Rica and um, countries like that are now you know kind of uh, around the ten thousand dollars per capita income, which is the cutoff for uh, a country to be considered a developed country, right? So for them, uh, convenience becomes more important. And then in the U.S., you could argue in a developed country like U.S. and most of Europe, Western Europe at least, uh, we are in an experience economy. You could say, right? Um, we are past the services where we're looking for memories. Okay, that's the most important thing that we're looking for. So um, this, this idea that we look for happiness is reflected in how um, economies evolve. And um, there is a framework called experiential marketing that uh, my good friend at Columbia University, Bern Schmidt, um, kind of uh, you know, talks about a lot and written a book on the or, or two on it. Um, there's one book that came out in 2000 called Experiential Marketing Strategy that's still uh, quite popular among a lot of marketers. Okay, and that is all about this. How do you kind of use your product as a prop and the service that you provide as a stage in order to deliver an experience? Okay, um, so, uh, and I can talk about some examples of it later on. But let me first talk about another strategy for um, evoking positive emotions in customers. And you can think of all of these strategies as strategies for delighting customers, not merely satisfying customers. Satisfaction is a more cognitive evaluation that comes about in a deliberative fashion. You use the product and you compare your experience with what you expected and that is satisfaction, okay? Delight is more spontaneous, okay? Uh, so when you use the product or in the process of using a product or a service, uh, you just uh, encounter a lot of positive experiences and uh, that ends up uh, being somewhat surprising to you and, and it delights you, okay? So that's the idea. So let me talk about one principle, uh, the very first one, hedonic dominance and functional prominence that um, typically you can use before a customer buys your product. And then the peak end rule is, uh, applies to context in which the customer is currently using the product. So it's a concurrent kind of a strategy that you can use while the uh, product is being used and experiential marketing uh, applies to uh, across the whole board. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my dog's sleeping here and I think he's having a nightmare in case you're able to hear him. Um, okay, so. Um, Paulo. Okay, um, all right, so. <laughs> let's talk about hedonic dominance and functional prominence. And in order to talk about it, actually, let me, um, uh, let me actually do a little experiment with you guys, okay? So I just quickly looked through the, um, the participant uh, list and uh, it, it seems like quite a varied audience. There's lots of men and lots of women. Yeah, imagine for this thought experiment that you're a single person and you're really interested in going out on a date with a, with a uh, male, okay? So all you women out there, if you're heterosexual, this is for you. And, for you um, uh, uh, guys interested in guys, 
uh, this is for you as well. But even if you are a guy not interested in guys or a, a woman not interested in a, in a guy, just imagine that for a moment that you're in that situation, okay? So imagine that and imagine that you go out on what's called a speed date, right? I don't know if you guys are aware of speed dates. Speed dates are, they used to be very popular, I think 15, 20 years back uh, when we were starting to do this research um, where you go and meet a bunch of people in a bar or, or in a restaurant. And typically there's a long table set up with maybe 10, 15, 20 chairs on one side and another corresponding set of 10, 15, 20 chairs on the other side. Um, and you as a speed dater would go in there, let's say that you're interested in a man, uh, dating a man, um, and you would get to meet 15, 20 potential partners. Okay, and before you go out on the date, um, just to kind of help you clarify what you're looking for uh, in, this, in, this, in this date, you would be given a questionnaire and you, you'd be asked a bunch of questions. You know, how important is it that the person that you meet is uh, your date is smart and successful, right? How important is that? How important is it that they are romantic? Okay, things like that. Uh, you'd be asked these questions and then you would rate all of these uh, attributes on a you know seven point scale. One being not at all important, seven being super important. Now, so let me pose that question to you guys. Okay, so how, how important is being smart and successful in a date? Okay. So let's see you guys type it out in the in the uh, panelists chat. Uh, how important is being smart? Actually, let me kind of rephrase the question. Is being smart and successful more important or being romantic more important? So if you think being smart and successful is more important, just type out one. If uh, being romantic is more important, type out two. All right. So, okay, all right. So we have a little bit of variance here. Uh, but by and large, it seems like one is winning out um, so far, which is not entirely surprising to me because you guys are a smart and successful group, right? And so you're looking for somebody to be able to keep up with you. Okay, so that's what we typically find in a, um, in a business school context. So imagine that you go on a speed date and you meet these two gentlemen, right? And the one on the left is, of course, Bradley Cooper, really good looking guy, okay? Um, but it turns out that he's neither smart nor witty. He's not the sharpest drawer in the knife in the drawer, uh, but he's very romantic, okay? He's extremely romantic. He even brought a rose just for you that he's not giving out to anybody else. He has saved it for you because he likes how you look or he likes how, likes how we talk or whatever. Um, but I love it on the other hand, not so great looking, but he's very smart and very witty, okay? And he has you cracking up, um, but he's not very romantic. Now, if you're like most people, what we discover is that after meeting these two guys, um, most people, um, because looks do matter, it turns out, right, uh, are kind of um, uh, uh, kind of um, attracted uh, by the guy on the left, Bradley Cooper, and, and they definitely want to go out on a date with him, but not necessarily with Lyle Lovett. And imagine that you yourself are in that situation. And the question is, would you change the relative importance of being romantic versus being smart or witty. Okay, and what we find is that people do change how important these things are. Okay, so on the next slide, you'll see this graph. So before exposure to these stimuli, to these men, um, attribute one, which is smart and witty, was more important than attribute two, which is being romantic. But after exposure to the stimuli, to these men, um, the importance ratings change. So this is a kind of a post hoc rationalization process and it turns out it's very, very, very prevalent. Okay, um, and actually we started out this research project because I, my wife and I had a similar experience when we were looking for houses in the Austin area. Um, and we had a certain set of criteria and it needs to be in this kind of a neighborhood with these kind of amenities and cost so much and so on or less. We had a budget constraint and we fell in love with the house that we currently living, uh, live in that we saw, we couldn't really place our finger on exactly why we liked it so much. Later on, an uh, aha moment occurred to us. It's one of the uh, few houses, I think, in the United States, at least in Austin, where you don't have a garage uh, on the facade, okay? And so it looks like a house, like you picture a house in your head or in picture books, it looks like that. There's no garage, you don't drive into a garage, okay? So the garage is a separate detached garage in the backyard. Um, and so that ended up being a very appealing feature for us. Um, and because we liked it, uh, we ended up changing how important all these attributes were. It was actually about 50K more than our budget, okay? And uh, I ended up justifying it by saying that, hey, you know, 
hopefully our incomes are going to continue to increase. And so the mortgage that we pay is going to be a smaller and smaller share of our income. And so we should really stretch ourselves right now, you know, when we are young and, uh, you know, it, it's worked out fine overall, but it does kind of uh, showcase that we engage in this uh, post hoc rationalization kind of a behavior. And what this points to is this idea that uh, hedonics are actually our aesthetics or things that are emotional in nature. This goes back to the idea that everything that we do is ultimately so that we can lead a happy life at some level, uh, have a huge influence on our behavior. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the functionality doesn't matter, right? Why do I say this? Because if you look at these results, okay, um, they are changing the importance of the so-called functional attributes. They don't need to. People could very well say that, look, being smart and witty is just as important um, as it was before I made the decision, before I saw these people, but it turns out looks are super important too, okay? So because Bradley Cooper is so much better looking than I love it is, I'm gonna choose him, not because I've changed the attribute importance, but because looks, which is a thing that I hadn't considered up to this point has entered into the equation and I have to confess, okay? It's super important, but people don't do that. People don't do that because people believe that justifying a choice on something that's cosmetic is a shallow thing to do. And it turns out this is true even in relatively functional product categories, like for example, uh, computers or laptops. I actually say even in categories that for which hedonics is, a, is, is important, like laptops and cell phones nowadays, right? So people feel a little bit uneasy saying that I chose my phone based just off looks. Okay, uh, or that I chose um, a laptop or a, um, a gadget just based on looks. People want to be able to justify their choices on functional features, even though in reality they've been seduced by, inveiled by the hedonic features. And this principle, we call it um, hedonic dominance and functional prominence. So people in the end base, choose based on emotions. And we find it across a vast variety, about eight or nine product categories from not just um, houses and cell phones to people, but also in the category of schools and hotels and um, lots of different services. And our most recent studies had to do with dog adoptions. And, uh, you know, people say that um, having a, a great playful personality uh, is slightly less important than being an intelligent dog. Okay. But if the good looking dog is the playful dog, then they'll change their attribute importance ratings. Okay, what this implies is that you have to improve the hedonic appeal of your product because that's what's gonna drive people's choices. And this is particularly true for experiential products, not the ones that are commodity products, right? But at the higher end of the value chain, uh, it's especially true for those. But you also need to provide functional reasons for why the customer uh, would choose your product because either to themselves or to other people, they're gonna justify the choices based on these functional features. And lots of brands do this so well, right? I mean, maybe Apple um, uh, is, the, is the kind of you know, poster child for this, for this idea of uh, improving hedonic appeal, but uh, providing functional arguments for why the products need to be chosen, but there's lots of other examples as well. Okay, so I'm at actually 251, so I, I, I'll stop here. I just have the summary up there and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Amanda, to see uh, if you've made note of any questions and you want to ask them on my behalf, on, on sorry, on the uh, panelists' uh, behalf. Yes, we have gotten um, a few uh, questions. Um, so the first one is, in your opinion, who holds uh, the most influence whether our product or service has reached its last iteration stage? Is that the stakeholders, customers, project managers? Um, who, who sort of makes that call? Yeah, that's a great question, right? I mean, ideally, I think that you need to be um, the, the team that makes the call, right? Ideally, first of all, it's a team rather than one individual. So one of the things that the, um, the head of uh, IDEO says there, that it's not possible that the boss is the one with the great insights all the time, right? Uh, it can come from somebody else. And so in a similar way, I, I don't think that it's the boss that knows what the um, final iteration of the product is, right? And which is the product that we're gonna launch. Um, I think it's gonna to have to um, be a team decision. 
but it's the team itself should also incorporate really, I mean, the customer's viewpoints. And I think the customer is always right, is probably true in this context as well. And so the more the, the version of the product that was most appealing to the target segment is chosen, I think the greater, greater the chance of success. Great. Um, the next question is, how do you recommend, what do you recommend as the first steps of the design thinking process? For those that are new, this is their first time sort of exploring this, this concept. How do you recommend they get started? Yeah, so um, we can use design thinking in literally every, almost every decision that we make in our life, okay? Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, if uh, you're thinking about what um, dinner to make tonight, right? It's a, it's a mystery, it's a problem, right? You wanna solve it, it's not a puzzle because you don't know, it doesn't have a mathematical formula that you can apply to, you know, out pops a recipe. Although nowadays, you know, I saw a fridge in um, Best Buy the other day, which uh, kind of has this scanner that can look at all the ingredients inside your fridge and suggest a recipe for you. So um, I thought that was cool. But um, so you're, you're trying to come up with a recipe that's gonna be pleasing to everybody and there's gonna be some constraints, right? Some people are allergic to certain things and not so whatever, right? So you gotta take all those into account. But once you have that problem of coming up with a recipe uh, or a dish that you wanna make, uh, you kind of break it down into this, this process whereby you're gonna go through some iterations, although you don't need to necessarily cook all these iterations in this example because that would be too expensive and, and you know, um, uh, lengthy, I think. But you could uh, kind of ask people, you know, so there's a brainstorming that you could have, right? Brainstorming is huge in, in the design thinking literature. Uh, you saw that in IDEO as well. And so there's a brainstorming part that you could have. And then um, you uh, take ideas from different people and then see what the best set of ideas is. And uh, then you kind of, you know, uh, go with that. So that would be the process. You, you kind of define the problem to begin with, okay? And then you look at who your target customers are, who the, who the stakeholders are, right? Who might get affected with the shopping cart, for example, it wasn't just the shoppers themselves because the shopping carts could be, uh, could pose a danger to pedestrians, you know, if they catch the wind. So there's lots of different stakeholders uh, in, that, in that case, and there could be for your product uh, as well. And then uh, you kind of go through the right process of, you know, prototyping it and, you know, showing people how it could look like and what the functionality could be look like. And if it's a product, then coming up with a tangible product prototype, even though it's not made out of the final materials, maybe it's made out of thermocol or, or wood or something like that, but so that people can actually kind of you know, play around with it a little bit. Um, and then they'll come back to you with uh, things that they think work and things that they don't like. And then, in, then you go and uh, develop it further and so on. So that would be the process. And um, the next question was, you know, how, where do you sort of draw that line between observation, research, the things that are somewhat removed from listening to customers and what people are saying they want? So how do you, how do you bridge those two? Because as you discussed, a lot of times that can be very different. So how do you sort of meet in the middle with those two? Yeah, oh, yes. so I, I guess, I mean, the question is coming from this idea that people often don't know what they truly need or want. And so if you ask them directly, then maybe they're not going to be able to have the insight of what they truly need, right? Um, and so there are a lot of these observational techniques that are, you know, big in design thinking. Um, there is this really nice book by a guy called Paco Underhill. It's called Why We Buy. And he used to own this company called EnviroCell, which is this consulting uh, organization that would help uh, retailers mostly uh, come up with kind of new ideas, okay? And what they would do is um, actually install these time-lapse cameras across the retail um, layout, and they would observe how customers behave. They wouldn't ask customers uh, what they wanted or what they needed, uh, but they just observed how people behaved inside the store, and they came up with so many insights that are now like, you know, legendary almost, okay? So Paco Andrel is a huge figure. And so I'll just give you a sampling of two or three insights that I think that you, know, uh, you can probably relate to. And you can also kind of relate to this idea that these would not be things that customers could, could actually articulate, right? One of the things is that it turns out that American customers, when we enter a store, we have a tendency to slightly veer towards the right, okay? 
we have a tendency to go towards it, right? And so the time-lapse cameras are looking at thousands of people coming in, right, over the uh, days and weeks and months, and all of them have this tendency to kind of go slightly to the right, okay? Uh, it's not a huge right turn, right? I mean, it's not a sharp right turn, but just veering towards the right. And uh, for a long time, people were puzzled as to why this happens. But it turns out that we do that largely because that's the side of the road on which we drive. So, you know, they looked at what happens in UK and in India and people <laughs> veer slightly towards the left, okay? Um, and that has implications for store design, right? I mean, you walk into an HEB, you'll see that it's uh, set in a race course pattern, it's called, right? Where most of the important things that you're almost always gonna buy uh, on every trip are on the kind of outer edges of the store. And the milk is often the one that's farthest away um, because, you know, that's a perishable and people often buy it you know, every time they go to the store and they want you to walk through the whole store because if you walk through the whole store, then seeing things is going to jog your memory that, oh yeah, I wanted pasta sauce too and things like that. So they want you to see as many things as possible so that uh, your shopping basket becomes larger. Okay, so that's, you know, veering toward the right is one thing. Another thing, it, it's called the butt brush theory. So the idea is, and this is especially true in shopping kind of establishments, what EnviroCell found is that if somebody is kind of looking at a piece of clothing, and they're considering buying it. If something happens that brushes their butt, okay, so brushes the backside, right? okay, maybe it's somebody walking through the narrow aisle, or you know, it's just um, uh, a table or something like that. And then they get so distracted that you know, 50, 60 percent of the time they just drop that piece of clothing and move on. Okay, so uh, you don't want butt brushes to happen, right? So you got to kind of think through how that might happen. Uh, so things like that, you know, just uh, incredible uh, the amount of insights that you can get by observing people rather than directly asking them. Absolutely. Um, so then our final question is, um, can you suggest any additional resources, books or online resources um, for our attendees that are interested in learning more about design thinking and some of these concepts? Yeah, sure. So that book that I talked about, Why We Buy, I think it's a, it's a really neat, neat book, um, uh, particularly for those in the kind of, um, retail service kind of a, uh, sector. Uh, there is a really interesting course and I like it uh, a lot. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that I talked about today is from that course uh, by a professor named Lietke uh, at uh, Darden in Virginia. And it's uh, available on Coursera. I don't know how much it costs now. When I took it, I think it was uh, $200 or something like that. It's a design thinking course. Uh, if you want the certificate, I think that the videos, many of them are free to watch. But if you want a certificate, you need to pay about 200. So I would recommend that course. That's great. Thank you um, so much for joining us today, Raj. We really appreciate your insights and you being here with us today. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. We hope to see.